like to welcome everybody back to the second Tim talk, actually the third one of the day. I'm going to go back to Chip and Ham for the other ones. But the um, morning was great, have lots yeah. of wonderful speakers, and I think today's, this afternoon is going to be just as well. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jerry Peters, who's a local developer and my brother-in-law. Um, his professional career expands 20 years of executive management positions, including being the CIO of one of the largest banks in Chicago. He um, also had academic challenges by obtaining a law degree and passing the bar exam. And then his personal challenges came when he decided to sail around the world. So he stepped out of the business world and took three years to sail around on a catamaran. Come on up, Jerry. Come on. That was fantastic. Good afternoon, and thanks for inviting me to come. Um, Mucho Gusto is the name of my sailboat, in case you were wondering. Um, and uh, as Joyce said, uh, it, actually 15 years ago now, believe it or not, I can't believe it, it seems like just yesterday, uh, I had the joy of purchasing this boat and deciding to sail around the world. Uh, the, the theme of today's uh, uh, presentation is uh, Achievement Is, and this was a goal of mine, and it is an achievement, I guess, to have completed it, but I'm going to, as I talk through this today, I'll explain why I think that sailing around the world is actually kind of the, the prime example of it's not the destination, it's the journey, uh, because the destination is right back where you started. But the journey is what was really the achievement, and the lessons learned during that was, was, uh, was, was what most remarkable for me. Um, I just mentioned to a couple of you that this slide presentation was put together ahead of time and is fixed and there's too many slides and there's two hours worth of material here which we're going to cover in 20 minutes. So I ask for your indulgence now, I'm going to, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. Um, so what does it mean to sail around the world? This is the beginning leg and started in, uh, actually in Martinique where the boat was purchased. We moved back to Florida, did some work on the boat and departed from Florida heading down across the Caribbean. Um, I, I, I sailed alone, but I sailed with family and friends that joining me on all these legs. So I'm not going to tell you who was in the boat because it's going to take too much time to explain. But uh, friends joined me in Florida, sailed down to the British Virgin Islands, which is uh, right in here, and we stopped and met other boats. Uh, moving along very quickly, we, my sister joined us in the British Virgin Islands, and we moved for the first time to a place that wasn't quite uh, America. This is the, uh, my first acquaintance with uh, other worldly kinds of cultures. Uh, these are the Kuniala Indians. They have lived in this area, uh, which is on the, east, on the Caribbean coast, just south of the Panama Canal, for over a thousand years. They have their own culture, their own language. They are part of the Panamanian country, but they are independent, sort of like our Native American uh, tribes in, in America. They are, they are uh, in, in, uh, an indigenous culture, as I mentioned, they have their own language, their own currency, uh, and they have, um, and they support themselves through subsistence farming and fishing, uh, and they also have a certain amount of trade, which is represented here in their textiles, uh, which are called molas. Uh, they are unique to the Kuna Nation. Uh, they are the only, or one of the only, uh, areas in which they interact with the Panamanian culture and the American culture. Uh, they're beautiful. This woman is holding this up, but not to show it to me. She's holding it up to hide herself. Um, we were inundated with these lovely people. They came out to our boat, uh, and no less than 50 of them boarded. And I bought a number of these, but they wanted me to buy and us to buy from each of them, and we couldn't. We didn't know how to get rid of them, so we took the camera and said, started taking pictures. And for whatever reason, they didn't like that, and that got them all off the boat. So. Um, so quickly moving along from the Kuna Nation to the Panama Canal. Panama, as you know, is the nation that hosts, that, that maintains the canal. It took us uh, three weeks or more to get from the Kuna Nation to the Panama Canal. Not because it's a long distance, but because the government bureaucracy associated with getting into that ditch is pretty difficult, especially for small plastic sailboats. 
this is mainly uh, a ditch used for very large uh, freighters and they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees for each transit through that canal. And uh, needless to say, sailboats don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get through. We do spend thousands of dollars, however. Anyway, I'm taking this picture from the deck of my boat. I'm, I'm lashed to another boat and we're looking ahead to a sailboat and a freighter that's in front. That's actually a very small freighter by Panamanian standards. Um, it is interesting, uh, it's an interesting process, it's kind of intimidating because there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of rules and we don't know what they all are and they are in Spanish. So we have this gentleman who is a pilot for us. Uh, he stays on board, goes through, keeps us out of trouble, explains what's going on, gives us a heads up and tells us what, what's, uh, what we need to worry about. When the water comes in and when the water goes out of that canal, there's a tremendous uh, turbulence in the water and when the ship's propellers start, it's like being in a washing machine, and it's a little bit intimidating. So he uh, kept us calm and cool. We left uh, Panama on the next leg of our trip. Um, my sister is still with me. Uh, Panama is way up here. Uh, we came out, went down to Ecuador and across to the first stop, which is the Galapagos Islands. But when you look at this, it's sort of interesting, I think. I, and I'm sure many of you, think of the Earth as being comprised of a bunch of land masses. And when you look at this from outer space, that's the Pacific Ocean. It's amazing how much water that our planet is covered by and how long it takes to get across that in a sailboat. Um, skipping ahead to the Galapagos, which is the first real stop along the, the um, Pacific Transit. Uh, these are the islands that are roughly a dozen islands that were uh, made famous initially by, by Darwin, where he did his initial research on national variations and species among the various islands. Uh, they are still today maintained as a, a very, a very well-maintained national treasure for the country of Ecuador. The country of Ecuador we did stop in is in turmoil. The, the culture there, not the culture, but the government and the, uh, and the people are in turmoil uh, economically, socially, politically. But somehow the Galapagos are maintained as a, uh, a sacred place for them, which is wonderful for the world. Um, the species are still as varied as they were when Darwin was there. Um, strange lizards that are saltwater living and they spit at you when you walk by them. Um, uh, sea lions everywhere crawling uh, down, the, down the main streets of the cities or into your dinghy if you're a sailboat and you have your little boat behind you, they, they decide to hop in and sun themselves which is fun because they don't want to get out and uh, if you have to go someplace it becomes awkward and they also tend to use them as restrooms so cleaning is a bit much. Um, birds, um, spare, I mean uh, finches were the original subject of Darwin's research but the most interesting bird to me there is the blue-footed booby and they're just fun to watch. They have bright blue feet obviously, um, the fuzzy white one on the right is a juvenile and they are incredible flyers and fisher, fisher birds. Um, they fly very high, they, they, they survey the water for fish, and then they dive swiftly and deeply into the ocean, coming back up with fish. It's, it's fascinating to watch. And then the other problem is that when they fly away with the fish, there's other birds that follow them and snatch the fish from their mouth. So they do double, double work. The Galapagos tortoise, another indigenous species, and the most important species on the island are the people. Uh, they're beautiful and lovely and charming. And this is when I developed my first sense of what wealth really means. These people uh, live a very humble life in terms of measured in dollars and possessions, but a very wonderful life measured in terms of uh, their, their culture. Uh, and I developed a theory, which is my own alone and perhaps wrong, that you can judge the wealth and the health of, an or of a, of a uh, society by the look on the children's faces. The next move, which is 3,500 miles from the Galapagos and 18 days at sea with a friend of mine uh, was across the Pacific Ocean to French Polynesia, the first of the French Polynesian islands. Uh, these are the Marquesas. Uh, they are very ancient islands. They are the foundation for the Polynesian, Polynesian culture. People that were, it's a little unclear as to how these islands became populated originally, but they've been populated for at least 2,000 years. Um, and the people from here populated the rest of uh, Polynesia, including uh, up north to Hawaii and down south to, to New Zealand. So there's a common thread of language and culture that, that spreads among all those. They're absolutely beautiful islands. 
And that's the first view you have after being 18 days with nothing but sea. It's, it's breathtaking and like being on a movie set. Here's, uh, that was the island of Iva Oa. This is Nuka Iva. This is Uapu. Uh, very interesting and uh, evocative names, but they're all incredibly um, exciting topography created by volcanic activity. Uh, part of the culture there uh, is the, the Polynesian culture is still very much part of uh, the society. It's a French colony. French is the official language. Tahitian is also an official language. But the language spoken here is Marquesan uh, among the, the locals. Um, and so they bring with them the culture that extends back at least to 400 AD when this was the religious, uh, an example of the religious altar. Um, these uh, were, are, are, have fallen into disuse because, as you might imagine, the missionaries educated the people as to um, how they should abandon the, these, these points of worship, and now most of the people living there are Christian. These have been abandoned, and they have not been destroyed, and it's amazing to me that they haven't been. Um, and they are just randomly in the jungle. Uh, as, you, as you hike through them, you run across these... Uh, without any signs, no guideposts, no uh, tourist uh, information. Uh, just more example of, uh, of, the, of the jungle. Um, one of the things that I was fascinated by and became more fascinated as time goes by is the agriculture and the food that uh, the various cultures use. This is a, an eel farm. Uh, and it's been, eels have been raised like this for uh, thousands of years in, in this culture. Uh, this also is a modern picture of an outrigger canoe but it is a direct descendant of the outrigger canoes that were used to populate the entire Pacific Polynesian Rim. They're still in use today. They're used in use recreationally. They're also in use for transportation among islands. Next leg. We're moving quick, but I don't know how much time we have. Um, <laughs> leaving, uh, leaving the uh, Marquesas, uh, another fairly large passage down to New Zealand and then across to Australia. Uh, following the path that the original Polynesians followed to, uh, to uh, settle New Zealand. I was now, my friend that sailed with me to the Marquesas had to leave and return home, and so I was uh, alone and had to sail by myself for the first time, which was uh, a little bit intimidating. And I sailed uh, a few days to the Cook Islands in a place called Rarotonga, and I was there staging to go to New Zealand, which was uh, a 10 to 15 day trip. And I was going to sail by myself. My friends, who were other sailors, were a little nervous about me doing that. And they thought I should take uh, some crew, and so they identified an excellent crew for me. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a sweetheart. Um, she uh, and her mother, uh, Rhodesia and uh, Susanna, were our New Zealand natives who were living in Rarotonga and needed a ride to New Zealand. And so I took them on as crew. And I had a wonderful time with them. I was very nervous to begin with because I didn't want to be responsible for a child. Um, but they became uh, really close friends, and I'm still in touch with them today. And it brings up another thought that being on a sailboat with somebody is a crucible. You either you, you, Your relationship changes. It either gets very good or sometimes not so good. And this, this relationship was, was wonderful. And we arrived, arrived in uh, New Zealand safe and sound. Although it was very difficult getting here. The seas were rough, the winds were rough, and she taught me a lesson which was uh, the difference between an ordeal and an adventure is attitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, her attitude was that it was an adventure, mine was, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we arrived in uh, Auckland, which is a very lovely urban environment, but that's just the beginning of Australia, I mean of New Zealand, and we're going to go through quickly to see that it's also comprised of volcanoes and geysers and glaciers and snow-capped mountains. Can you believe this is in the South Pacific? Uh, it looks like something out of Norway or the Swiss Alps or something. Um, absolutely beautiful. And any of you have seen uh, Lord of the Rings, this is the, this is the place in which it was filmed. It's, uh, it's phenomenal. It's also got a wonderful shoreline with, dotted with millions and hundreds of islands all around uh, its coast. And we departed from here, uh, this is in Wellington, and headed off to Australia. Uh, that was uh, my friend Rick uh, joined me at this point, and we had a 10 or 12 day trip across the Tasman Sea uh, to Sydney, which is a world class city. It's comparable in many ways to New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Toronto. It's a wonderful, wonderful city. Um, but Australia is 
actually fairly uh, lowly populous, not the proper word, but there's not, it's not a very heavily populated country. There's 50 million people in, in a landmass that's the size of the United States. So once you get outside of here, you're into, um, into Sorry. Picture of my friend uh, throwing a boomerang, which is actually more interesting than the koala that's buried in this tree. But there's a koala; they're they're, they're not just uh, on postcards; they're they're everywhere. Um, kangaroo. That isn't in, in the uh, deep woods or the jungle. That's on the edge of a golf course. And to an American like me, they seem really cute. But the Australians are less enthused. Uh, they're pests. Australians also have a sense of humor. Um, so this is further up the coast of Australia, and this is where the chapel will come to you. If you want to get married on your boat, uh, they'll bring the boat out to you, and you can, you can have a wedding ceremony. Australians in general are very fun-loving people. I sailed, if you, if, you, if you overlaid the United States on top of Australia, I entered Australia in Sydney, which is approximately where uh, Charleston, South Carolina would be in the United States, and exited like Washington State. Canada wasn't in the way. Um, so I, I, I didn't circumnavigate Australia, but I went uh, all the way around the top part of it. And, and I, it, gets, it gets more rural and more um, cowboy-like as you go along. Um, so when I left, I, found, I said that I think Australia reminded me a lot of a NASCAR tailgate party, but with more beer. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, next leg was across the Indian Ocean. Uh, didn't stop, hadn't did plan not to stop at all. And I was sailing alone, so I hired a crew this time. Remember that story I told you about the crucible and how you either get really better, have a better relationship or a worse relationship? This one was the other example. We didn't like each other very much after a few days, and so we had the opportunity to learn how to live on a small boat for 18 days without enjoying each other's company. Uh, so we stopped early. Oh, that, okay, I'm going to go back. We stopped early at the Seychelles, and I flew him off to uh, someplace else, and my sister joined me again. A year later now, she was on the boat before, but she's a teacher, and this was her summer break again. So she came down, I paid for her to come down and join me in the Seychelles, and we're going to head up the Red Sea together. And that, as to, she came down after a 24-hour flight and 24 hours getting ready to go, we headed out, and that's the weather we went, ran into. That is not the middle of the night. That is the middle of the day, and that's a sandstorm. Uh, ordeal, adventure, I'm not sure. So we headed up um, across from the Seychelles where we, where we started, up here to the Horn of Africa and around the corner into Aden. That's Yemen. Uh, this area here is Somalia and it's, was it was full of pirates then, it's worse now. I if I'd known then what I know now, I would not have gone here, I will never go there again. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, but we made it. We, we sailed at night and with no lights and we sailed up with radio silence and we kept going. And we arrived in Aden. Aden is the main port city on the southern coast of Yemen. Yemen is an interesting country. It is the most un-American, not, un not anti-American, but unfamiliar uh, territory that I have ever been in. Uh, and I'll show you a few pictures that will explain it to you. But the, the people are friendly, well, most of them anyway. Unfortunately, this was two weeks before some of these people, whether the, the, these people or their friends, uh, bombed the USS Cole and killed 17 U.S. sailors. And this was the beginning of the Al-Qaeda movement uh, in, the, in the world. But I thought Yemen was fascinating. Uh, this is the street life on Yemen. That's a real working camel in a cart. There are very few cars. And the cars they have are 20 or 30 year old Russian Ladas. Uh, they've just been left behind by uh, modern society. This is a street scene near the market. You can see the um, there's hardly any women on the streets ever, but when they are, when they do appear, uh, they're covered from head to toe in black, and it's 100 degrees out there right now. Uh, this woman, actually, I don't understand it, but her hand is exposed, and that is extremely rare. She would normally have gloves on. Um, 
so it was very uh, interesting. We all learned a lot more about the Arab world and the Muslim world, but this was the first time I'd had a chance to experience it. But lovely markets and food and, and charming people, um, a bounty of, uh, of uh, um, sustenance for the people who live there. Again, um, my guide called these uh, ninja ladies, and uh, you don't see very many, but when you do see them, they do look like ninja ladies. Uh, this is, again, an example of how well the city and the country is faring economically until you get here. This is a mosque in Aden, and you can see the difference between how the, the people's housing and their marketplace is maintained and how their mosques are maintained. It's obviously a priority for them, and it's a very beautiful building. <coughs> this is a, I just met this person on the street, and I just thought that was a, just a, a lovely family, and I wanted to ask them if I could take a picture of them. I think, and I don't know this for a fact, that they are a member of a, of a, of a class that is uh, an upper-class uh, individual in Yemen. The, um, the dagger that he's wearing in his belt is a symbol, is not only a weapon, but it's a symbol of status. And I uh, just thought it was an attractive family scene. Uh, unfortunately, from my perspective, that lovely girl in the forefront is going to be shrouded in black in another year or two, um, which is you know, my own personal bias. Um, this is Salim. He is the guide that uh, helped us throughout this entire process. People in Yemen do not speak English, and I don't speak Arabic, and so and it's very intimidating. The Yemenis are very formal. They have a lot of process required to, for a boat to enter into the country, and forms in Arabic that have to be filled out, and Salim knew that, saw an opportunity to help and to make some money, and he became a friend. He spent five days with us, escorting us through the bureaucratic process, but also showing us a city of, of which he's very proud. Uh, on the last day we were there, he borrowed a car from somebody and he wanted to take us up into the mountains to show us the city from, from a distance. And uh, we, only one door on the car worked, so we all came in on the driver's side and crawled over the seats and got in and went up to the top went and, and spent about an hour, hour and a half touring the countryside and then came back into the city, which is nestled at the bottom of a series of hills. And we're sitting at the top of the mountain and he's pointing out places that we had already visited so we could see them from the, from the sky, so to speak. And uh, it's, he, he was, I'm going to try and use a very, very poor Arabic accent, but he, he doesn't speak English very well. And he was uh, pointing things out and said, there is the, the, the mosque, and there is the marketplace, and there is the fishing village that we went to, and there, there is, oh my God, Pizza Hut. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a Pizza Hut there, and he had only seen it through the eyes of people that were traveling in his car, and every time he took an American up there, they responded with, oh my God, Pizza Hut. He thought, he thought that was the name. We're, I'm running out of time, probably. Okay, uh, quickly. Uh, we left Yemen and went to Saudi Arabia, Sudan. Saudi Arabia is one of the most disgusting places in, in in the world from my perspective, and if I had more time, I'd tell you why I feel that way. It's a wealthy country that is poor, with poor from a, from a spiritual standpoint. Beyond that, we went out to, to the top of the Red Sea and uh, spent some time touring uh, Egypt, and uh, we, we are doing the tourist thing on a camel in front of the, the Giza pyramids out just outside of Cairo. Cairo is another amazing city. Um, when you mount a camel, they, they lay down on the ground. They clasp their legs and they put their belly on the ground and you then get into the saddle and then they, they stand up. Well, they stand up quite high, as you can see. And so this is the gentleman that was helping us. He doesn't speak English either, but he knows four words. Hold on, lean back. <laughs> and, uh, and it's quite an experience to go up on top of a, a camel. Um, left Egypt, headed into the Suez Canal, much different than the Panama Canal. Panama is a very intricate mechanical process of locks and ups and downs and going through lakes. Suez is a big ditch that runs from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, and you just go straight out and into another world. This is Greece. Uh, these are the Greek islands, uh, and this is just one of many sp spots we stopped in the, in the Mediterranean. But going from three months in the Arab world with the culture that that represented to Europe in one day, about well, three days, was uh, pretty shocking. Uh, nude beaches. Uh, they don't have nude beaches in Yemen, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, and older, rotund Germans in bikini speedos. 
on the beaches. Um, I think the Arabs had it right. They should cover that up. Um, more, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's calamari uh, waiting to be had. Uh, okay, we're going to go through Western civilization, Athens, uh, Venice, Florence, Rome, Gibraltar. It was a lot of fun. Uh, that was four months or five months worth of travel. Uh, we're now in Gibraltar at the mouth of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Gibraltar's, that's the rock of Gibraltar. Uh, it's an English colony tapped on Spain, and Spain doesn't like it. Um, so they make it very difficult to get in there. It's hard to get in by road. Most everything comes in by ship. You can't get an airport in there because there's a rock in the way. So they have a small airport that they constructed for small aircraft, which is really a road for automobiles that when a plane comes in, they ding, 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 <laughs> shut down, take the cars off, land the planes, and then open it back up again so the cars can go. Um, here's the most common uh, resident of Gibraltar, and these are nasty beasts. They throw things at you, they <laughs> jump on you. If you don't treat them the way they want to be treated, they make your life miserable. Left Gibraltar, which is um, right there, headed down to the Canary Islands and then across the Atlantic. I was, I had friends with me through all that Mediterranean thing, but I was alone here, and I decided to go it alone and sail across the Atlantic by myself, um, which I never thought I would possibly do, but I did. Um, and arrived here. This is the Caribbean. It's lovely. It is characteristic. This is characteristic of all the islands, uh, villages, fishing villages. Um, it's volcanic, and this is uh, the island of Dominica, uh, where my friend Pancho is uh, cooking eggs on the ground. Uh, and there's a boiling lake. It's very. Uh, it's a very active area. The whole Caribbean basin is nothing but a bunch of volcanic mountains. Uh, but there's also some things that are not as quite as exciting. This is Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, also a Caribbean island, and uh, uh, it's sort of the other end of the spectrum of the Caribbean, Caribbean beauty. This, however, was uh, that even though they're poor, they, have, they spend time to practice their faith, which is voodoo, and enjoy themselves and celebrate with very strange homebrew uh, liquor, and uh, this gentleman is biting the head off of a live chicken. Uh, right across the border from Haiti is the Dominican Republic, and this is the Dominican Republic. I point this out because Haiti is very poor, and the Dominican Republic is quite wealthy by comparison, but they're not wealthy enough to afford road size. There's a problem with this road, as you can see, uh, but rather than put yellow markers and signs and, uh, and guardrails, they just left the car there because that's a pretty good indication that you shouldn't drive, <laughs> and it's pretty inexpensive. Back to the children uh, concept. These are these are just two children that followed me all around one of the islands in the Caribbean. Uh, they were they were really charming to be with. And this is another gentleman from Saint, in Saint Vincent who is uh, trying to uh, not trying to who's selling us some fresh fruit for our breakfast. But it's an indication just generally of the the joy that is tends to permeate. The Caribbean. This gentleman is, I, I know him, he's a friend. He's very friendly, and these are all vegetables and fruits from his garden or from his neighbor's gardens, and that's life in the Caribbean. Um, that's the trip. Um, the lessons, uh, you know, there aren't that many. It was an incredible experience. There's, there are a thousand more stories, uh, but what I did, the biggest thing I took back from it was a redefinition of what I consider to be wealth. We measure wealth in terms of dollars and possessions and things like that are that are valuable and, and useful. Many of the people in the world measure their are envious of that, but also recognize that they have family, they have food in their backyard, they have uh, smiling children, and just like um, you know, the difference between an ordeal and, a, and an adventure is attitude. The difference between wealth. And poverty is attitude as well. So, thank you very much. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions for Jerry? What no? boating experience did you have before you bought this boat? Yeah, on this journey. Yeah, I had spent. Uh, I I'd sailed most of my life, my adult life, uh, on various smaller boats, and never been really offshore except I sailed from Chicago to Michigan, which is.